Hi there everyone, welcome to another episode of Tip of the Week. So this week we're continuing along with the cutout series uh, that we're going over how to break down, rig, and animate a cutout character. So last week we went over the breakdown process and then this week we're going to go over the hierarchy. So to get started on working on my hierarchy, um, first of all I'm just going to turn off or delete the reference layer. So remember I had imported these layers uh, in from Photoshop, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete those layers that are uh, the bitmap layers that I used as reference. And you can tell by the way when a layer is a bitmap layer because it has a bit of a different icon in here, so this layer um, with the background icon on it is the bitmap layer. So I might just leave in the original whole character model sheet and just turn it off for now so I don't see it. So that I have it there as reference and I can also lock it just to make sure. So now I can go in here and um, let's also turn off the analysis layer and lock that as well. Okay, so now I can go in here and start to actually define a hierarchy. Now there's two main ways of defining a hierarchy in Toon Boom software. The first is in the timeline. So if you have quite simple sort of parent-child relationships, then the timeline is a fine place to do this. Um, let's take a look at some uh, basic layers here. So I have uh, the, the hair elements that I want to be a child of the head, right? So the head, when the head moves, I want the hair to move as well. So when I want something to be a child of something else, I can simply select it and then drag and drop it until it's directly on top of the other element and then it's going to indent into. It's just a simple left click drag. So all of these elements here that are um, you know that are going to be on the facial features or uh, the hair they're all going to be children of the head because I want them to move with the head when the head moves. And you'll notice that these things will start to reorder themselves also in the um, in the camera view when you do this drag and drop. And don't worry about that because I'm going to fix that afterwards. So we won't worry about the front and back for the moment. So let's just make sure that I've grabbed all of the elements that are um, that are there and drag them in here. Okay. So now I've got all those facial features as a child of the head, then I'm good to go there. So now, of course, like I just mentioned, it's kind of changed what's happening here also with the uh, which layer is in front and which layer is in back. So when I select something, um, whoops, it looks like I've got a little dot somewhere. Let's get rid of that dot. You can tell when you have an outlying dot because your bounding box gets really big. So if I select the head, I want the bounding box just to be the correct size of the head. Okay, so now I select the head and it selects all the other layers underneath it, which is great. Um, but uh, the layers are all in the wrong order. Now, the thing is that the head, I want to kind of go behind everything else. And the timeline, the timeline only has direct parent-child relationship concepts. So if I was using animate, for example, I could put a keyframe on the head and I could nudge it backwards in Z space. But when we're using harmony, we don't like to do that because when you put a keyframe on something, if you remove the keyframe, it's going to pop back out to its other position. So instead of putting a keyframe, let's just go ahead and change the layer order in the network view. So when you're doing cutout characters, the network view is the other place where you can define hierarchy. Now it's going to look a little intimidating at first, but the network view is an awesome place to do a lot of different things. So the network view, if you think of it this way, is just a visual representation of what's happening in your timeline and in your stage, in your scene. So each drawing layer is represented by a module here. And so each module is something that you can select and you can define the connections that are going into and out of the drawing layer. So if you can see, let's just look at an individual drawing layer for a second here. So if I zoom in here on the ear, you can see that the ear has a port at the top. This is the in port for things that are coming in. So the in port 
is green here, so we know that it's looking for a peg layer or another drawing layer that contains peg information. So a peg layer, uh, which we'll get to in a moment here, is a layer that contains the position, rotation, and scale information. So when you're animating things, you'll often want to have a separate control over the keyframe animation, which you can put into a peg layer, and the drawing animation, which you can keep in your drawing layer. So in other words, like if you want to move the position, rotation, and scale of an element, you can isolate that keyframe into a peg layer. So let's take a look at that for a second so that we can understand what that's all about. Because I'm actually going to recommend that we use peg layers instead of doing these direct parent-child relationships. So let's undo all of these guys. You can undo, you can remove a port connection just by dragging on it and then kind of letting it hang in space and that's going to disconnect it. So we'll just disconnect these guys for a second. Boop, boop, boop. And then I'll show you what a, key, what a peg layer does. Okay, because what I had done before was I just connected directly the, uh, the different head elements there, like the hair, to the head. And so when I move the head, it moves the hair. Now that can be nice, but sometimes you want to be able to move the, um, the head independently of the hair. And using a peg layer is a good way to do this. So what I'll do here is I'll just select all of the drawing layers in my entire timeline here by holding down shift and then hitting select. And then I'm going to add a peg by clicking on the add peg button, which is going to create a parent peg for each one of those sub elements. Now, if I go into my network here, I can order my network. So I'm just going to click on the display module and then um, the order network up, which is in your network view toolbar. If you don't see your network view toolbar, you can either right click in the gray area there and select network view, or you can go to windows toolbars and then network view. So now I can select the display module, hit order network up, and poof, now my network has been ordered. So I have now drawing layers, and then each drawing layer has a peg layer that's attached to it. So what does a peg layer do? Um, let's just grab the face. So if I grab my head layer, I can um, always hit O in my network view to center on selection and see what's going on here. So I have a peg layer. When you select the peg, it's going to make the whole selection yellow so that you'll know that you have the peg selected, and then you can make a change. Now, if I check it out in the timeline, the same O shortcut also works in your timeline, by the way, too. And when you use a shortcut like O, center on selection, then it will center on the selection depending on which view is selected. So here I have the red outline around my timeline, so O is centering around the timeline. When the red outline is around the network view, then it will center around the network. So you can see here when I made that movement with the peg layer selected, it put the keyframe, that little dot there, see it put the keyframe onto the peg layer. So that means that it's very easy for me to select the, the keyframe there and drag and drop it around if I need to make a change and it's not like directly tied to the drawing. So it's a very powerful way of working and it really helps you to keep things organized. And we'll see more examples later of why this is useful. So for the moment though, what we want to do is we have peg layers that will control the movement of each individual drawing layer and that's great. But then what we really want to do is we want to create an additional peg layer every time we want to have something be a child of something else. So in other words, here if I have the head, I want to create another peg layer that I can use to group together all of the elements on the head that I want to move together. Or maybe I want to group together all of the facial features elements. Now, of course, I've kind of reordered the ordering here, so I can't really see anything there. So let's talk about order in the network view for a second. Let's get that guy over there. So when you're working with uh, the order here, the head, as I can see, is on the top. In the timeline, the top is on the top. In the network, the top is in the left. So there's this big module on the bottom there called the composite. Now, the composite really just gathers together all of your drawing layers and lets you do something with them. So you can gather them together and render them out and write them to disk. You can gather them together and display them. Um, but you can also just gather them together when you want to make a group, for example. 
Now if I select that head layer again, when I select the head layer, you can see that the, the pipe that um, defines that layer becomes highlighted here. It's the second pipe. Now the left side of the composite is the top and then the right side is the bottom. So if I want to move the head layer further back or underneath, I can actually select that that port, this little dot here, I can select the port and I can drag it to the right. And as I drag it to the right, it's moving it behind those elements. So I can get it far enough back that it's behind all the elements that it should be behind. And then, you know, I'm good to go now. So then I might want to take this layer, which is the, the hair sort of back layer, and then put that just on top of the head. And um, then this layer here, I kind of want to go on top of that so I can kind of just sort of adjust these guys, moving them around as I need to. And I always find it's good to have the camera view open at the same time because you can use the camera view over there to visually um, select the layers that you need and then move them around. It makes it quite easy to work with. There we go. So the only one that I've got that's kind of out of place now is that ear should be behind. So if I wanted to go behind the entire head, then I'm going to move it all the way in the back. And there we go. So now the layer order is more or less like I want it to be. Once I change the layer order, I can just do another order network and just keep kind of working like that, ordering the network as I go um, so that I have something that, that sort of makes sense here. So what a lot of people like to do is a lot of people like to gather together those facial features that they want to animate together. So um, for example, here I might want to gather together the different eye elements into an eye group. Um, so like if I want to do that, I can just, there's a nice shortcut that you can know here, which is control shift P or command shift P on a uh, Mac. So control shift P is going to select uh, a module here and create a parent peg. So it basically does the same thing that that add peg button does, except it puts it in a, a nicer place in your network. So control shift P is, is very, very useful. So I can see here I've gathered together the eye elements that are in the front, and then I can just kind of connect them together with that module. So by dragging the out port of the peg module into the in port of those other modules, it says, hey, when I make a movement on that peg, send that movement to the other elements. But I can still independently animate those other elements inside. So this is where it becomes very, very powerful. Okay, so let's just do this same thing now on the um, other elements. So control shift P is going to allow you to make the parent and then you can connect it to the others. So then the next connection that I'm going to make is for the uh, face or the facial features group. Sometimes you might want to go and reorder these ones, by the way. Let's call this maybe just the eye front peg, kind of like my eye group. And usually it's a good idea to come up with some kind of a naming convention. Um, I think I mentioned last week that I uh, like to go with a front and back naming convention. So the front in your three-quarter view is the one closest to the camera, and the back is the one farther away. The reason that I always go with a front and back naming convention is that um, you, when you flip the whole character over, if your character is symmetrical, when you flip your character over, then the front is always in the front and the back is always in the back. Whereas if you do a left and right, when you flip the character, the left isn't the left anymore. It's now on the right. Um, so I'll show you that again later. So I can kind of see here when I look at these elements, that the front should be on the left-hand side because the front should be in front and the back should be in back. So I've kind of got these in the wrong order. So I might just want to go ahead and change these a little bit. So I want to just move this three pipes over. So bloop, bloop, bloop. And now I've got my three front eye elements actually in the front. Front, front, front. And then I can always do another reorder. I just like to, when I'm getting going in the beginning, I like to just use the automatic reorder. At, at some point later on, you probably want to go into your own order. 
network to kind of like, you know, make some small adjustments, but that's okay if you use the regular order network up in the beginning. Okay, so, and then the nose should really be going between those eyes. So I want to move the nose over a few. Think about there is good. There we go. Okay, so um, as you get used to doing this more and more, it'll be easier to work with that composite. But sometimes what you also want to do is you might want to put a smaller composite or like a mini composite together when you're doing a group of elements. So, for example, if I want to group together the eye, then this is where I want to add, first I want to add a composite to do, to do it. So remember I said that a composite simply gathers layers together. I can add a composite at any point in my network and I can then connect some elements to it. So let's say these I elements in the front. And then I can actually connect this composite back out to the main scene composite if I want them to still show up in the scene. But what this allows me to do is very easily gather these layers together. So I can actually put them in a group if I want to, which I'll do a little bit later. But I can also use this composite when I want to do special effects on it. So if I want to do some masking or things like that, then you need to have a composite to gather things together. When you're looking at a composite layer, um, there are different modes that the composite can be in. Now the best mode to be in when you're doing cutout character rigging is called pass-through. Now what pass-through does is pass-through simply gathers together your vector layers but it doesn't actually flatten them. So when you look at the as bitmap um, option, what the bitmap one does is it literally flattens those layers down and creates a bitmap image out of them. So it, pixel, it pixelizes, it rasterizes that image. Now the reason that we don't want to rasterize the character, you know, halfway through the character composite is that um, you might need to go back and use some vector effects on those different elements later on. So if you're ever going to use vector effects for doing things like, um, you know, uh, selecting a color inside your character or, you know, doing uh, masking and things like that, then it's usually a good idea to keep it as pass-through. So on the cutout cut -out character, we'll always use pass-through. In fact, it's even a good idea on your main composite of your character to put this one as pass-through as well. The one that it's really good to put as bitmap is the very last composite in your scene. So, you know, usually your character will, keep, will actually be connected to a different composite. So when you bring your character into your scene, there's going to be a scene composite there. And then this composite is really just a composite of my character. So the last composite in your scene should be as bitmap so that it flattens everything down. But all of the composites earlier on should be as pass-through. Okay, so now keeping that all in mind, then maybe I want to also do a composite here for this eye here. And then I can kind of slide it in there. And then the mouth, the hair. With the hair, it's a little bit tricky because I have some pieces of the hair that are in front of the ear and some pieces that are behind. So it's kind of, you know, up to you how to define it. I just realized that, um, this piece of hair isn't far enough forward. It needs to be in front of the ear, and the ear is all the way on the left. So I might just want to slide this piece of hair over to the left. So when you have elements that are, like I have the hair that's in front and I have the hair that's in back, I could composite together the hair that's in front um, in one composite and the hair that's in back in another composite. Or I can kind of just leave them all, you know, outside for the moment. So it's really just up to you on how you want to how you want to tackle that. And the interesting thing about character rigging is that character rigging is all um, about problem solving. Like there's always more than one way to do things. So there's no sort of right way and wrong way. There are suggestions that I can make about how to make your life easier and, you know, best practices. But, you know, there there's many different ways. And you'll, you'll see that when two different people rig the same character, they'll probably rig it two different ways. And that's okay. So here, let's just, for the sake of keeping this clean, I'm going to gather together those hair pieces that are in the front, and I will put this composite to pass through, and then I will 
plug that back into the main so you can pause it. And as you do this, you'll notice that we'll be able to really condense it down so that it doesn't look so big, because right now this scene is really big, so we'll be able to gather those together. If I do want to animate all three of these hair pieces together, if I ever do, then I can put a control shift P and I can put a peg that will control the hair group for the front. And um, you can always have it there and if you want to use it, you can use it. If you don't, then you don't. So um, it's always a good idea to have these things there. And then we'll also be adding deforms to this rig so you'll be able to see how that works. So for the hair that's underneath, I probably also want to just composite those guys together. So I'll just go through and, and do a few composites here. I'll start by just rigging the head for this uh, for this demo, and then um, I'll, the rest of it will be easy once you do the head. Okay, so now that I've got those together, the next thing I want to do is define a facial features group. So right now I've got um, a group here for the eye, but I want to do another one. So Control Shift P, and then I'm going to rename this one just by clicking on the yellow options box there. Let's call this facial features. And so the facial features peg I usually use to connect to all of the facial features, so the nose, the mouth, and the eyes, but not the ears, because the ears you want to move independently. But here it's very useful sometimes to be able to just go and move the facial features around inside. So that's why I like to gather those together. And then also I will put a composite to gather those together as well, because in case I want to put them in a group, then, um, then it's a good idea to have a... Uh, composite. So I can gather together the eye, the nose, the back eye, and the mouth should go in between them, something like that. Also, breaking things up into smaller composites sort of breaks your rig up into these bite sized pieces that make it easier to understand. So, you know, when you're looking at the rig of the, of the face, then you can be like, oh, okay. So I've got the rig of the face here, and then all of the elements for the face are in there. And we'll definitely clean this up more as we go, um, and we'll put them inside groups. Now for the moment, we'll just do everything out here. Okay, so I've got the face done now. I've got the facial features group. I've got the ear. I've got the hair. Um, and that's pretty much it for that. When it comes to the neck, now something that some people don't realize is that the neck is actually the parent of the head, and not the other way around. So... What happens with the neck, um, let's just figure out in my network here where it is. Oh, the neck is like all the way in the back. Okay. I guess it's deliberately back there, by the way, because you want it behind these other elements, which is fine. I mean, they don't have to be next to each other, but the neck is definitely going to be driving the animation of the head. Whoops. So just for the sake of making this easier to understand, I'm going to grab this and move it over here for a second. This is one of the really nice things about working in the network view, that it's so visual. You can just sort of drag things around. So what I want to do is do a Command Shift P on the neck so that I can make another neck element. And here's the head of the peg here. So the neck is now going to be the parent of the head. So when I select the neck, it selects both the head and the neck but I can still separately animate the head and still separately animate the neck. And the reason it's the neck is because you're going to want to pivot the neck from the base and have the head follow that movement. And I'll go over the pivot points in just a minute. So now that I've got the neck in there, I've got the head in there, then um, I also want to make sure that all of those elements that are following the head are a child of the head. So let's put another peg layer in there that we're going to call the head. And I just did the same command shift key thing. And I'm going to put it kind of in between. So I still have the ability to animate the head on its own. But here, I just want to have all the elements that are connected to the head. So I want to have the, um, the, the, the hair. I want to have the facial features. I want to have the ear. And you can always just click on the peg to highlight everything in yellow to do a quick check to make sure that everything is in there. So that's it. Now I'm done with my head. So now the way that you rig the rest of your body kind of depends on, you know, how many layers you've broken things apart into. 
when we look at it just sort of in a, a, in a bare bones way, um, then usually we kind of start from the torso and work outwards. So if you think of it, the center of gravity, kind of the whole character is around the torso. So the upper torso is going to bend from there, and then the lower torso is going to bend as well from that point. So um, whether we have, it depends on how you split it up. You might have a hips layer in there. You know, you might just sort of work everything off of a, a torso layer. Um, in this case, we have broken it up into a hips and a torso. So I usually like to break things up into upper body and lower body. So for lower body, it's really easy to understand. Um, if you have broken up your character into upper leg, lower leg, then of course the upper leg is the parent of the lower leg. In this case, we're going to use a deform for the legs, so we're just going to do it as one piece. And then the shoe elements are going to be a child of the leg. So if we go and check out where that is in our network view over here, then this is my leg, and um, so I actually have this hips layer here. The hips layer is kind of going to be a parent of both legs. So I want to have the hips layer that I have to be the parent of the front leg and the back leg. But I want the leg itself to be a parent. Now also you might see me doing this sometimes where I slide layers in. So I did a control shift P and it kind of created this peg just floating. I can select the module and hold down alt and alt is going to slide it in between some other things. So then if I slide it in there, I can let this peg layer here be the parent of the shoe, which is over here. So we do see that we need to do a little bit of reordering to kind of get things in a place that makes sense. So even though the shoe is in front, um, the shoe is just kind of in front of the, of, the, um, of, the, of the leg itself. So it doesn't need to be all the way there. So I can move the shoe back a bit to be, you know, just kind of on front. And if some of these things are easier to do in your timeline, you can go ahead and pop in your timeline for a second. Because I know sometimes it's easier to see it in here. So, um, you know, it depends on how you like to do it. When you're, when you're moving things in the timeline, though, make sure you grab it from the peg. So, for example, if I want the shoe in the front to be a child of the leg, then I want to grab and drag and drop onto that peg there that I created. So um, you, can, you can do the drag and drop in the um, timeline as well, but sometimes it's easier to do one and sometimes it's easier to do the other. So um, for example, all of these little shoe tongue elements, those sorts of things we'll do here. But the thing about doing the drag and drop in the timeline is that I'm going to have to go back and change the, or the layer order anyway in the, in the network, but at least they'll be closer together. So over here, the hand then is going to be a child of the arm. And uh, I also have the bracelet, which is going to be a child probably of the hand. You're always going to drag and drop the peg onto the other peg, by the way, and not onto the drawing when you're doing a drag and drop in the timeline. And uh, I have to figure out where everything went. Where's my hand? Do -do -do. O is my friend. O for center on selection is my friend. And then I can look up where the sleeve details are. The sleeve, the hoodie sleeve stuff is going to be a child of the arm because you want it to all follow the same movement. So even though the, the, they're a part of the hoodie, they're actually, uh, in terms of the um, animation, it's going to be part of the arm. So I can make that a child of the arm peg there. And I may need to go back and, and reorder things and touch them up and that's okay. We'll do that in the network. But this is just to get them a little bit closer together. And then in this character, because I did the, uh, the drawing layers for the torso all separate, you could have all, you could have easily done this all as one piece. So you could have had just one layer that was the torso and it could have the sweater and the body on it. Now I decided to do these sort of separate layers that you can turn on or turn off um, just to give you a little bit of flexibility with how you animate things. So um, because I've done them all as separate details and I want to find where my main torso element is, which is called body here. And then I want to make those other elements a child of that. So the other thing that you might want to do here for 
ease of use is you can color code stuff too in your timeline and so when you color code things it just kind of makes them easier to find so I can go now and find the sweater detail and just drag and drop that down and look for the look for the pink one and drag it down there okay so now that I've got that order a little bit better let's do another order network so now they should be closer together in the network view, which will allow me to do some fine detailing on how everything is. So when I select the body peg now, you can see it selects all of those things. But I just also want to have another peg that does the body on its own, so that I do still have the ability to animate the body on its own just in case I need to. And then here I've got the sweater body, the sweater detail, the necklace, the hoodie jacket in the front, the hoodie jacket in the back. So I kind of want to reorder the front and the back a little bit. Okay, so now that it comes to the arm element, this is where I want to kind of redefine what's in front here as well. So, um, the hoodie sleeve should go on top of the sweater, which goes on top of the arm. Okay, so the torso and the arms look pretty good as far as the drawings go. Um, looks like there's a little issue there with the drawing, but I can always fix that later. You know, we mentioned earlier we want to make sure that we have enough overlap. Um, so then the last thing to define the order for is the legs. So let's make sure that the back leg is actually in the back. And usually you do want the, uh, the back leg behind uh, the hips itself as well. And the front leg should come in front. Okay, so um, then the last thing is I want to just make sure that the whole hips and leg group here is going behind the torso. And when you want to make sure that things are behind other things, you can always also just temporarily collapse or expand. So expand or collapse there. And then if I want to just easily move the hips behind, I can simply select the entire collapsed group and then move them behind everything. And voila, now I've got the whole... Uh, hierarchy sort of ironed out and then the layer order more or less correct so now from here I can do my last order network up and then I can go and make some of those fine tune adjustments so just like I want to do it um, for the facial features I can do a similar thing here with the legs where I group them together uh, into composites so I'll come in here and just create composites for each one of the legs. And I'll also create composites for the arms. And you can even create, when you have a lot of details in the body, you can even create a composite for the body elements as well. Okay, so now I can start to see this sort of shaping up together. So now that I've got these composites that are defining the different areas, I can easily see which elements are grouped together. So here, I've got a group of elements that's defining, um, you know, where the hair is. So I can then do a control or command G for group, and that's going to group my selection together. So control G. And then I can name this something. So let's name this hair front 
And I usually put a jazz G on the end of it, so, so I remember that that's a group. Even though it's fairly obvious that it's a group, I still just like to put a dash G. Then I have the ear, and then here I have the eye front group. Naming conventions are very, very useful, by the way. Now, when you get a situation like this where you have sort of several different things that are nested inside each other, you might want to nest some groups inside. So, like, I might want to have a group over here for the eye, and everything is sort of like on top of itself, so let's just get it out there. These guys are going to go in the hair, so let's just temporarily move that to the side. So I can grab all these eye elements, and then this is my eye back group. And then together, the, the eye in the front, the eye in the back, the nose and the mouth makes my facial features. Now, I can either group that or I can just kind of leave it out in the main timeline. Um, you know, whatever makes you happy. Um, some people like to have lots of nested groups inside each other, some people don't, so it's really just a personal preference there. Um, and I'll go ahead and create a group here for the hair. I'm going to have the head and the ear, and the back is not connected to anything, that's bad. So let's make sure that that's connected to my head peg. Now, you might be wondering, oh, I don't have anything yet that's connecting together the torso and the arms. So, this is where we get into creating um, the upper body peg. So, what I usually like to do is I just take the body and I do my control shift P thing and I create this body that I like to call the upper, the upper body. And then I use the upper body peg itself to connect to um, all of those different elements, such as the arm, such as the, the head and neck group, and then the other arm, which should be floating around in the back, which I haven't, I haven't yet connected. It is in the back. So those guys make my upper body. Um, so that way you can kind of have everything connected together and moving from one central rotation point. So now I'll take the body here and do a control G on the body group. So you can see how now that I've got these elements tightened up quite a bit here, then I can bring them together uh, a lot closer so they don't have this ginormous timeline sort of. So I've heard people call the network do many different things. I've heard it called the octopus. Um, I've heard it called the squid. I don't know. It seems to always be some kind of sea creature. But, um, but yeah, so, so you can kind of gather these elements much closer together. And maybe I will, just for the sake of um, keeping this really nice, I will do a, another group here for the facial, facial features. At this point, I like to do a little manual reordering just to kind of get it exactly the way that I want it. And um, different people like to do it different ways. Um, some people like to cascade them down. Some people like to have them all in a straight line. Um, there's no right or wrong answer for that. 
one there, even though I, I've had some people argue vehemently that they like the straight line method. So it's just, you know, whatever floats your boat, really. So that's just my reference later underneath. Okay, so, so that's it now. This is my character rig. Um, now, the one thing that I'm missing is that I have the upper body group there, and then I have uh, the hips group on the bottom. But I don't have anything that's sort of connecting together everything as one what we call master peg. So I can just take that upper body peg, do my control shift P, and then I can call this usually the character's name master, something like that. Um, or you might call it character three quarter, um, something like that. Uh, I usually do like to put master on there somewhere just to make sure that I know that that is the ultimate peg. It's the peg that all other pegs are connected to. And so now I can connect the, the lower body or the hips. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll rename this lower body so that that's kind of clear. Lower body peg. So there's the lower body peg and then there's the upper body peg. And then everything connects into the master. And now I've got my hierarchy done. So in terms of just finishing up this hierarchy uh, demo here. So that was quite a lot that we did already. But there's just one other thing that we want to do to finish out the hierarchy piece. And that is to define the pivot points. Now there are many different ways of doing pivot points. I'm going to show you guys a little bit of an advanced technique that I personally think is the best way to do cutout characters. And that is to not animate on the drawing layers but to only animate on the peg layers. So um, there's a quick way of me sort of looking at the properties of a layer as well. If you click on the down facing arrow here, you can add layer properties as a view. And then this is going to update depending on what you have selected. So basically what I want to do is I want to go into all of the drawing layers and turn off animate using animation tools. So this is an advanced thing, so I'm sorry that uh, that there isn't a necessarily fast and easy way. In any case, there is a script that exists somewhere to do this. Um, so if you're interested in using a script to do it, if you have like a lot of lot of layers, then um, you know, let us know and we'll we'll get one to you. But the easiest way to do it is just to have the layer properties view open and just turn off animate using animation tools on the layers. And that way you can be absolutely sure that you've got it done. So I usually just go through from left to right and um, kind of tackle it one group at a time. And you just want to turn it off on the drawing layers. You don't need to do anything on the peg layers, so just the blue drawing layers. Turn off the animated animation tools. Now what that does is that when you select a drawing layer with your transform tool, which is your main animation tool, it's going to put the keyframe on the peg layer above it. And this is super, super useful for keeping um, keeping the drawing layers and the peg layers isolated out so that you don't accidentally have keyframes on drawings and drawings on keyframes and then wondering, oh, what's going on? So this keeps it really nice and organized when you're going into animation. It just takes a slightly longer setup when you're doing the rigging portion. So you're going to hate me now that we've finished all this, then I'm going to tell you that there's an easier way to do it for next time, uh, which is that there's a preference that you can turn on to, to not have the animate using animation tools thing. So if you go into stage preferences and then advanced, if you see here, there is a preference that says element module animate using animation tools default value. Um, that's a long way of saying that when it's checked on, animate using animation tools is on. If you check it off, then every time you create a new drawing module, it will have that off. So if you're doing a lot of character rigging stuff, then you probably want to turn that off so that new drawing layers will not have that. Um, I'm just going to keep it on just so that I have the same as what the default that everyone's working with is. Okay, so now that I have turned off uh, the ability to animate on those layers, um, then we'll see a little bit of an indication in the timeline because you'll see that there's no functions attached to that drawing layer anymore. Um, when I do create another one, just so you can see a new drawing layer, drawing layers have functions under them when they're created by default. Um, so when you turn off Animate by Animation Tools, that function area goes away. So the functions now are available only 
on the, um, on the peg layers. And then here's another preference. Um, depending on the way you like to animate, uh, you might want to change this to be, um, there's two different methods or two different ways of animating in, on a peg layer. You can have it set as 3D path or you can have it set as separate. Separate makes it slightly easier when you want to control very carefully the um, X, Y, and Z position and um, the, the uh, rotation and scale and things like that. Um, if you have it set to 3D path, you get a, a path and a velocity, which makes it easier to define the ease on it. So it kind of just depends on how you want to do it. Um, the functions behave slightly differently. When you put keyframes on a, on a 3D path, you get a nice smooth interpolation, whereas when you put keyframes on separate, then it's more of a linear interpolation. So, um, you know, there you can kind of define that for yourself. So I'm just going to leave it as 3D path for this demo. If you do decide that you like a better working with separate, then there is a way to do that as well. And that is in the general tab, default separate scale position, and then you can define it for pegs and for elements. So you can just kind of define what you want. Here, the default separate position for pegs is unchecked. So if you want it always to be separate when you create pegs in the future, then you can check that on and then it's going to be separate. But I'll leave minus 3D path. So the last thing that we want to do now is we want to define where the pivot points are for the rotation. So I'm just going to go in and do this by um, adding or uh, adjusting the pivot point on the peg layers because when we're working here we're going to be animating on the peg. When you're defining a position of a pivot point on a peg layer, the best way to do it is using your rotate tool. When you use the rotate tool and you move the center pivot of the rotate tool, it moves the pivot point for the overall drawing layer. For example, if I look in the properties of that layer, this section here that says pivot is being adjusted. So the default position of a new pivot is in the zero zero, right in the center of your drawing frame. But if you drag it up, it's moving it there. Notice this is one of the few things that cannot be animated over time. So when you move the pivot point, it's a permanent move. It's always moved in that place. Um, for the purposes of, of character animation, the majority of the time that works just fine. The only time where you sometimes want to have it different is when you want to have sort of different views, like a, a top view, a side view, and so on, on the same timeline. And I usually don't recommend people to work with things on the same timeline anymore. Uh, not only because these days, most of the time, we use effects to get rid of the need to have a, a front and a side view. We can do pretty much everything from the three-quarter view now. Um, but if you need to have different views, then you can always have them separated out in their own groups in the timeline. And then that makes it way easier to rig and, uh, in fact, easier to animate as well. So there's no downside to doing that. I'm just going to go ahead and speed through this portion where I put the pivot points on, uh, but I'm just using the rotate tool and dragging and dropping that center pivot into the position that I want it to be on the peg layers. Okay, so now that I've finished defining the pivot points, I can always check by just clicking on the layers to select them and making sure that it selects the, from the right pivot point. For those elements like the arm where I have the arm and uh, the sweater and the sleeve there, um, I've just set them all kind of eyeballing where the pivot point is because we're going to use a deform later to define the movement of the arm and the um, the, the, the clothes are going to be a, a child of exactly the same deform so they'll share the same pivot point. The only reason why I have separate pivot points set for these guys is if you need to do something separate with those layers like if you ever need to do a little extra squash and stretch just on the sleeve then you have a peg there to do it with. Um, now, 95% of the time, you might not need to use it, so it doesn't matter if 
the pivot point is 100% exactly the same from one to the other. If you want it to be 100% exactly the same, you can go inside the module and you can copy and paste those pivot values from the layer properties. But I really don't think it's necessary for the 95% of the time case. It's really just for that 5% that you um, that you need it. So with things like the mouth, by the way, if you have a very small mouth and it's hard to click on it to select it, you can always do something um, handy like you can create a little invisible color in your color palette um, that you can use just to make it easier to select things. So if I just create something that has an alpha of zero and uh, I paint with it, it's just kind of there and then it just makes it easier for me to click on it because I can just click anywhere and I can select that. So there's a handy little trick. Call that invisible. So when you want to animate things in the hierarchy, if I select the wrist there, if I hit B, that will go up to the parent elements so that I can animate the wrist and the bracelet together. If I hit B again, it'll go up to the parent element so I can animate the arm together. So as you're verifying your pivot points, you can just kind of try to move some things and see whether it looks all right. So, you know, I may have the pivot point a little bit off there on the wrist. So you can go in and make some adjustments as you go to make sure that the pivot point is in the right spot. And it looks here like it's actually not the, uh, the hand that's the problem. Maybe the arm is too long or whatever. So you can go in there and, and make adjustments as well if you need to make adjustments in the drawing. You really want the, um, the joints that you are going to rotate a lot to have kind of a circular uh, feeling to them. So if it's not, you can do it 100% circle as well. Let's go in here and just add an ellipse for the purpose of using it as a guide for the moment. Um, holding down uh, shift and alt will get a, get a perfect circle in there. So using that circle as a guide, then I can go in here and just make adjustments to the, um, the arm artwork. So it doesn't have to be perfect, but um, if you do want it to be perfect, you can make it a perfect circle. And then I'll just turn on Apply on Line Art and Color Art since I had been working on separated line art and color art for this. And I'll just kind of go in here and make a little adjustment. And then I can always get, get rid of that circle that I used as a reference. And then when I come back in here and rotate that hand again, see it's going to rotate much, much better now. And I'll show you guys next week how we do things like how we use effects to get rid of the lines, how we use effects to cut the eyes off with the eyeball. If you want to jump start on that, you can always go back and check out the eyeball rig um, tip of the week that was done already. Um, and then we'll also go over adding deform. And uh, so then after we do that next week, the week after, we'll be testing out the animation. So thank you guys for following along. We are moving along nicely now. Um, this is it for the character rigging portion. We've now finished rigging our character. Uh, we've assigned a hierarchy. We've used the network view to create the hierarchy for our character. Um, I guess the very last thing that we might want to do, by the way, is that um, when you are uh, finished with your character rig, you may want to just select the whole character plus the composite and put it in a group. And so when we put the whole character and its composite into a group, then we call this usually the character like three quarter pose group. And um, then it's just very easy then for me to add this into a new scene if I ever need to add it in a new scene. So that's it. So thank you guys for following the uh, rigging portion, and we will see you next week.